on this edition, doubts about new prostate cancer drug Provenge, abortion and breast cancer incidents, the chemotherapy fog phenomenon, and a new prostate cancer test that may detect more tumors. This is Ellen Baker, and Oncology Podcasting starts right now. Just last week, Oncology Podcasting mentioned about ODAC, recommended FDA-approved Provenge for prostate cancer. However, it is now facing opposition. Awaiting approval from the U.S. and Drug Administration is Dendrion's new drug, Provenge, the first treatment that aims to treat cancer by training the immune system to attack cancer cells. To top oncologists, however, have advised the FDA to delay the drug's approval since it failed to slow the progression of prostate tumors in two clinical trials that contained a combined total of 225 patients. While Dendrion has convinced many skeptics that there is a real benefit to Provenge, others argue that its studies do not rise to the level usually required for approval. Dr. Maha Hussein of the University of Michigan, along with Dr. Howard Schur of Memorial Sloan Kettering, both wrote letters to the FDA, stating the existing clinical trials for Provenge do not warrant approving the drug. According to Hussein's letter, one of the FDA's biggest problems is that the large study Dendrion is conducting might become impossible to perform if Provenge is approved. This 500-patient study compares Provenge to a placebo version of the treatments and ethical considerations might require switching those patients on placebo to the drug if Provenge is approved. But even if they are not switched, patients may drop out of this study instead of risking not getting the medicine. The FDA has until May 15th to make a decision regarding the approval of Provenge. In some case-controlled studies, induced abortion has been inconsistently associated with breast cancer risk. A recent study, however, found that among a predominantly premenopausal population, neither induced nor spontaneous abortion was associated with the incidence of breast cancer. The Nurses' Health Study, too, included 105, 716,000 women 29 to 46 years old at the start of follow-up in 1993. Information on induced or spontaneous abortions was collected in 1993 and updated biannually. During 973,437 person years of follow-up between 1993 and 2003. 1,458 newly diagnosed cases of invasive breast cancer were ascertained. The results of the study show that 15% of participants reported a history of induced abortion, and 21% reported a history of spontaneous abortions. The relationship between induced abortion and the incidence of breast cancer did not differ materially by number of abortions, age at abortion, parity, or timing of abortion with respect to a full-term pregnancy. Formally ignored as an illusion, chemotherapy fog, also known as chemobrain, is now getting some attention. After undergoing chemotherapy, many women have complained of a constellation of symptoms, including short-term memory loss, an inability to concentrate, difficulty retrieving words, trouble with multitasking, and an overwhelming sense that they had their total loss of mental edge. Many victims of this problem are thankful it is receiving attention, since many oncologists in the past would simply disregard and trivialize the issue, telling patients, quote, was all in their heads. And one patient stated, chemo brain is part of the language now, and just to have it acknowledged makes a difference. Though virtually all cancer survivors experience short-term memory loss and difficulty concentrating during and shortly after chemotherapy treatments, a vast majority improves. But about 15% of the nation's female breast cancer survivors remain distracted years later, though no one is sure why. Most oncologists agree that the culprits include very high doses of chemotherapy. The combination of chemotherapy and supplementary hormonal treatments like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors and early onset cancer that catapults women in their 30s and 40s into menopause. The main puzzle of chemobrain is that many of the symptoms can occur for reasons other than chemotherapy. 
For example, abrupt menopause, which often follows treatment, can leave many women fuzzy-headed in a more extreme way than natural menopause, which unfolds slowly. Since many factors besides just chemotherapy can affect cognitive function, more studies are necessary to pinpoint what exactly is causing these kinds of problems associated with cancer treatment. Until a cause is found, cancer survivors can seek support and share their experiences on websites such as breastcancer.org and cancercare.org. An experimental blood test for prostate cancer may help eliminate tens of thousands of unnecessary biopsies at the same time that it detects many tumors that are now missed by the test commonly used. The current test, PSA, measures a protein normally produced by the prostate, while the experimental one, called EPCA2, detects a chemical made principally in a cancerous tissue. Prostate cancer is one of the more perplexing areas of medicine, and physicians are unsure how to find it and when to treat it. Today, about 80% of prostate biopsies find no tumor, a percentage that is rising as physicians become more aggressive in searching for the disease. Physicians are hopeful that the new test will minimize the number of unnecessary biopsies and that it will be a substantial improvement over PSA. Currently, men are screened for the disease by a rectal exam and by the PSA test, EPCA2. However, is a protein that is part of the nuclear matrix, the scaffolding inside a cell's nucleus that helps it copy its genes. The Hopkins researchers measured it in different groups of men whose cancer status was known. They tried the test on 30 men with PSA readings above 2.5 and in whose biopsies found no cancer. All had normal EPCA2 readings. This suggested that the test may eliminate many of the false positive PSA result readings that are abnormal but apparently do not denote cancer. The new test is still being developed by researchers at Johns Hopkins and may become commercially available in 2008. That's all for this edition of Oncology Podcast News. I'm Ellen Baker. Thanks for watching.